Okay, so hey everyone, I'm back. It's been a while since I've been live. Like I said, life has been lifing, but I pulled a gratitude card today for motivation and I had to pause and remember that because just before I went live, little things began to go wrong and I was tempted to put out a post and say, you know what? I'm gonna record it and post it later or just go live tomorrow or go live next week and it's like no we're gonna make this work and we're gonna go live anyway because it, it just really it was a matter of me finding my makeup ruined because there was an accident at the apartment upstairs that water came down into our apartment and so just as I'm about to get ready I discovered my makeup was ruined and I'm like no that's not gonna stop you and you're gonna be grateful that the makeup was right next to your computer and my computer is in perfect condition did not get wet so I could sulk over my makeup or I could say yay my electronics are fine so that gratitude card really was a good card to pull this morning but yeah this is just it's going into December and I want to discuss the Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman is a book that I've had for a good long time now. Read it a few times and I pulled it out to read again. Um, I'm building on my four part series Connecting the Dots and if you haven't seen it, um, you can find it, you can find links to it on my page and I'll probably drop a direct link to it in the comments after this live is done. But like I said, I'm kicking off a December delve in and I'm going to take a six weeks journey through the five life love languages and their benefits. In my Friday freebies, I will post a worksheet. So this Friday, I'll post a worksheet that's going to go with the live from Monday. So you'll get a head start on what I'll be discussing on Monday. And yeah, and you can make comments and we could get into it. We can get into somewhat of a discussion from there. Reading this book now is is miles different from when I first got it. I was excited when I first got it because I'd heard so much about it, but I was in a I was in a place in a marriage where I was doing a lot of the work, and he he showed some interest, but he wasn't staying consistent. And reading it now, I'm in a different headspace because having had this knowledge. I was able to learn my current partner's love language and sort of let him know how I operate. So we're often on the same page. Today I just want to go over the first two chapters, so it'll be like an intro. Um, Chapman gets into the reality of getting married, and for those of us that are cohabitating, that includes us. I don't care what people are going to say about that. It's the, it's the reality that this book is about the shift in the permanence of a relationship whatever that is for you and the thing is things change once people move in and shit gets really real but after things become more permanent in a relationship and all the love rush begins to die down people wonder why their partner has changed or it appears that their partner is changing and you know we are looking at each other through rose colored glasses and everything's perfect and even if you do something wrong you just oh I'm sorry and I would never do it again and you know there comes a point in time where it's like the eye rolls probably start the sighing the agitation and you know Chapman attributes that to communication and the type of communication going on so you have to move past that surface stuff and get into the real nitty-gritty especially when you're living with a person and you discover their habits their rituals what it is they do in their existence every day in the confines of their home you're combining those two unknowns <laughs> essentially so it's the same way if we were to travel to a country that does not speak a language that we speak it would be near impossible to be understood or to understand the natives of that country because there's a language barrier, there's that hindrance, there's a blockage. And basically that's, in my opinion, that's how love languages work. If we're not able to be 
fluent in each other's languages and even knowing our own puts us in a position to be able to say this is how I'm affected and this is what I need. The book goes on to just to encourage us to define when love is good for our emotional health and not codependent or irresponsible judgment or irresponsibly indulgent. The examples given are like a wife that repeatedly picks up after her husband's alcoholic episodes and that's codependency or a parent that indulges their child's every wish which is irresponsible indulgence. We're looking for balance. <clears throat> See all of us have a love tank and what we do when we feel empty is the same thing as a child does when theirs is empty. There's acting out, there's misbehavior, and this can have a heavy impact on any relationship. So this is where I loop in, how I discussed what we observe and experience growing up that affected our navigation in our love relationships. That was my Connecting the Dot series. So every child has a love tank and it's waiting to be filled. And if it isn't replenished, then you have what people call acting out or a child that just doesn't know how to behave. Well, it's a miscommunication a lot of the time between the parent's own love language and the child's love language. And this can cause a child's tank to remain empty while the parents can be absolutely clueless. Oftentimes we feel like, well, I've gone to the ends of the earth for you and I've done such and such and you don't seem to be grateful. And sometimes it's not that the child is not grateful, it's just that they get it, but that's not what's filling their love tank. It's not what's giving them that that feeling that you understand them, that they that you get it. So a lot of times it's not just us hoping they get it. We have to understand whether or not they think we get it. And that applies straight across the board as they're growing up and going into their own relationships. And a child can also observe growing up how certain needs are attempted to be met and they can fall into effect, ineffective habits that may be going on around them. So that includes addictions or certain unpleasant behaviors. The emotional need for love is not something that we outgrow. It is lifelong and sometimes temporarily quenched by that hyped love rush of falling in love. But once that rush wears off, do we find ourselves or our partner misbehaving? Do we take the time to learn the love languages? There could be a radical difference between who you and your partner are when your love tanks are empty versus when they are full. Think about the Snickers commercial. Who are you when you're hungry? So this falling in love part, Chapman briefly talks about a woman who was head over heels and engaged within three weeks of dating a particular gentleman. Her fiance had actually proposed to her a week in and she felt like this was it. She had never felt this way about anyone else. This rose colored glasses affliction had her overlooking her fiance's previous two marriages, three kids, and having had three jobs within the past year. The attraction seems to trigger the loss of our common sense and that is temporary. It intensifies over those first few days in getting to know each other. However, it is not a stable foundation to build a relationship because it's not long lasting. Sometimes those of us can see those imperfections and things that will become huge issues later on, but we poo poo them and say, ah, love will conquer it all. Have I not been there a time or two or three? One of my nearest and dearest friends despised the way she heard my then boyfriend talking to me when we were in our early 20s. And well, let's just say he's currently now my ex-husband. We enter these situations glossing over things that are set to become huge issues later on. And being in love is not a feeling that lasts forever. It's not defined as that rush or that giddy, just met feeling. And that's not to say that your partner won't continue to excite you or give you that feeling when you see them. It's just that loving a person and choosing to love that person and make it work is the foundation with that needs to be built on. We are fooled by the euphoria into thinking we have an intimate relationship and we do not. 
um, physical affection and sexual intimacy is not the only intimacy that you can have a relationship that you can have within a relationship you need the mental and the emotional and all that good stuff roughly about two years in according to the book is when the rosiness begins to fall away at this point you can let yourself fall out of love and seek someone else because the illusion of perfection has been shattered or you can dig into the real elbow work of making your relationship work. I mean, it's just easy when things start to get rough to be like, you know what, deuces, I'm out. I'm not having it. I'm not, I'm not doing this. But you have to sit down and really look at what is it that you're really having issues with and how can it be fixed? The work essentially means shifting from the obsessive, you're all I think about phase to the emotional love, that deep shit. This is where reason and emotion need to be combined. It is where we need to understand the need for personal growth. And this takes effort and discipline. Upon our return from this high, true love can begin. We must know that our lover loves us by choice and sees us as worth loving. Our emotional health depends on our emotional needs being met. And feeling secure comes in in feeling assured that our mate accepts us, wants us, and is committed to our well-being. Love, according to Chapman, says, I am married to you. I choose to look out for your interests. And with this in mind, appropriate ways to express this, this decision must be sought after and it becomes second nature. As formal as all of this now begins to sound and lacking in spice and excitement and romance, what we re must realize is that it will naturally come when you have two people with emotionally full tanks. Full tanks can motivate us to step into our highest potential which has many benefits which includes looking out for our partners thoughts, feelings, what they like, what they don't like. It's considering them as we consider ourselves. A quick example of how this played out for me with my current relationship was instead of getting carried away with that la 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 hype, hype, feeling of newness and oh yes, I wrote out a list of questions and gave them to my partner. They ranged from where do you see yourself in five years? What did you want to be when you grow up? Grow up? Um, what do you, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Like just a broad range of questions that I look back and realize I may not have necessarily known about previous partners or they said one thing and did something else. And I just wanted to see where this new guy's head was at. I answered the same questions and we swapped papers. His answers gave me some insight into his mind and his expectations for the relationship and what he wanted for the future. I had operated previously on raw love alone and trust me, that cannot conquer any and every challenge. This time, I wasn't interested in how hot he thought I was or how fine I thought he was or the, what the chemistry was doing between us. I needed to get in his head as soon as possible and determine if there were any red flags I needed to be aware of. So taking all that into consideration that's how I see the first few chapters the first intro chapters of the five love languages and what I'm going to do is next week we will get into the first love language words of affirmation so I'll see you guys in the next one bye